Hey guys, it's Stel back here. I am bringing you my second episode of Storytime. And this one's about me being in Iraq. Since my channel is pretty much a Call of Duty channel, I'm going to do it over some gameplay uh, of here at Villa. And when I was stationed in Iraq, it was, I was there for 14 months and two, uh, two tours, two seven month tours, pretty much back to back. You're there seven months, come back for seven months, go back again. And we were stationed at this base uh, both times. It was called Camp TQ or Camp Dakotam, was its full name. And it's an old Iraqi air base, and it, it is uh, off of a, a lake. It's on a lake. Habania was the name of it, and which is west of Fallujah, which is west of Baghdad. So if you had Baghdad, Fallujah, and then Lake Habania, my air base was there. And one of the vehicles that I did drive uh, that we used over there was this one. This is a seven-ton, and uh, it's set up for passengers right now. And but it can be you can take the sides off and put on. Um, for the cargo and things like that and that was a pretty exclusive truck that we used and this was an older vehicle called the LVS it was made for those big Connex, Connex boxes those big train boxes that you see on the driving on the trains they can put those up onto those things that will fit on there plus it can hold other cargo and that sort of thing so those are the two main vehicles that I um, drove in, in, in Iraq and how, how it worked over there was uh, they flew in the goods or the shit I will say um, onto the airbase, we would take it off the airbase, they would load it onto our trucks, and we would supply the surrounding few areas, a few bases in our uh, AO. Uh, we would call what was called general support. We would support these bigger bases, who would then in turn take the stuff we just delivered to them, and deliver it to their smaller bases around the area, some of them being in Fallujah. So like, there was two big cities there, Fallujah, as you know, may never heard of that one, another city was called Ramadi, and they were, had two big bases that oversaw those two cities. We would supply those big bases, then in turn they would supply the little bases that were in the cities. So that was the kind of the concept. And I never really drove into the cities. Um, we always were on the outskirts and the, the desert roads and that sort of thing. Um, there were three main weapons that we used on top of our trucks. You saw that one uh, truck that had a turret on there and that was obviously where our guns would go. Big machine guns and there's three guns that we'd use. This is the MK, uh, or excuse me, the Mark 19 which is a grenade launcher machine gun. It fired really slow uh, like a thump 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 type of thing. Um, you could actually they, the rounds move so slow. You could actually if you could look if you looked at it right, you could see the round the rounds going down range. Um, that was one. This is another weapon. This is a um, a golf a 240 golf was the name of this weapon, and it's pretty much a light vehicle suppression of light vehicles. Uh, you could be you could be used as an anti personnel, but it wasn't that effective. And then this was my baby. This is the thing that I use. It's so epic that I have two show, uh, photos to show you. Uh, this is the uh, Mod Deuce, as we called it, or the um, M2 uh, 50 caliber machine gun. It is, I believe, the oldest uh, weapon in the U.S. arsenal that is uh, still in service for its use. I mean, there's other weapons like ceremonial swords that aren't used anymore in battle, but this one is still used in battle. And um, this thing was made to suppress tanks. It is a very slow firing rate, but it is devastating. Uh, you hit somebody with this thing and there's nothing left. Arms are ripped off. We call it the pink mist. You, you hit anybody, any any living thing with it, it just turns into a pink mist. Um, and this is what we would do. We would ride on convoys. This is what the desert would look like. Um, multiple vehicles. We would carry also cargo with um, uh, civilian vehicles. So they had civilian counterparts to us. They didn't carry weapons, but they also were truck drivers. Just normal truck drivers. And we would have, you know, four or five of them in between, uh, you know, one of our, one or two of our gun uh, gun trucks, and you know, our vehicle, our convoys could be, you know, 50 vehicles long, um, and that's how that's how we rolled on. And, and every, every other day, one day we'd go out and do a convoy, or I should say night. One night we'd go on a convoy. Another night we'd, we'd be loading, and the next night we're back doing that convoy. Come back the next night and do a, do a reload of the of the trucks, and this is how. The, this is how it went for seven months. Um, it was a, a pretty unique I experience. I do enjoy it. Obviously, at the time, I didn't. I did have a couple of instances that happened to me while I was over there. Um, I'll get into the big one. This one, this might be a little bit lengthy, but I think it sets it sets it up uh, quite right. I was uh, driving this vehicle. You saw this one already. Actually, with that gun, that's the seven-ton, and we were. Um, 
driving down one of the roads cause it's just left base about you know about eight miles out and we roll up on an army convoy that, that they hit one of those roadside bombs those IEDs as they call them um, and the, they, they had stopped they had to stop uh, you know, there was somebody that did have to get evacuated because of injuries but I think he, he was fine but uh, the pr procedure was if you get hit by one of the if your vehicles get hit by one of these bombs you have to call in the EOD unit or the explosive uh, ordnance unit um, so you have to radio back to base and have them, you know, get prepared and come out to you. And then that, that in itself, the getting them to come to you, is it can take a couple of hours. Um, so we were there probably about an hour and a half when they finally showed up. And then it took them another hour and a half for them to do their sweep uh, of the area to make sure it's clean. Because what these insurgents were doing near the end of um, my time there in Iraq was um, they would have two bombs, two roadside bombs. One would be, to, you know, to stop the convoy, like they did with that army convoy, and the second one would be uh, for to uh, attack those first responders. So if they get hit by the bomb, the original guys, it's guys that come to help those guys that just got blown up by the bomb, and then they get hit. So the, the, what we were told to do is call these guys in, stay in our vehicles, and wait until they come in before we can recover vehicles and things like that. Um, so it took them an hour and a half or so to, for them to do their sweep, and they did it, and they said they were fine. So they told us, our convoy, that we can go ahead and move around the other side, other shoulder to um, drive past these guys because they had to cover this, this vehicle uh, that got blown up. And so we did. Out My truck was the very first truck um, in the convoy, and we were rolling up to it, and I'm talking no more than 30 to 40 feet away than from, the, from the original blow-up hole, the IED hole my truck gets hit and at first I didn't know what it was I, I, I was the gunner on it so I wasn't driving and this thing blew and I thought my driver d broke my broke the truck so I'm yelling at him like what the hell did you just do and then I start tasting dirt in my mouth and I realized oh my god that was an ID um, what it was it was a pressure plate you know they had a pressure plate ID two plates and once my tires rolled over it uh, com completed the circuit and boom and what it was and here's the hole that is the hole um, it was two 122 rounds, basically it was two artillery rounds. You know, those big howitzer cannons that they'll call an artillery for. These rounds is what they used uh, to blow up my truck. Uh, my, as you saw, has the, the truck we were in has three axles. There's a back axle, driver side uh, tire that pretty much there's nothing left. Absolutely nothing left. And that was my, that, you know, I got blown up. That was how what happened to me. I got blown up in my truck. Um, uh, luckily, I was safe. My driver was safe. We were fine. Uh, I was pretty wound up about it. I was very, very pissed off because how could this EOD unit, who's supposed to be, you know, experts at this thing, do this? You know, miss this thing that was so damn close to the original hole. So I was pretty disturbed by that. Um... But that was the nature of the beast. I mean, we were trained for that. And this is this is what happens. You know, you you just have to respond for that. Do I regret my time in Iraq? No, I do not. Um, if I have to do it all over again, would I go back? Well, I didn't have a choice. I would go back. I, you know, I, it was all about being with my my, my guys, my, my fellow Marines, my subordinates, my superiors. It was all about the guys I was with, and wherever they would go, I would go too. That's how the mentality of it was. And so, yeah, I would go. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I got another story to tell you, but as you know, this video is getting kind of long, and I know it was a bit lengthy, and I apologize for that. Thanks for sticking with me on that. Um, so, in my next episode, I'll talk about the second story that happened to me, and this, this story that I just told you. Um, the second story happened about a month afterwards. So, I got something. That, two things happened to me t during one tour, so it was pretty, pretty crazy. So, all right, guys, click your likes if you liked it. Leave a comment if you so desire. I'll catch you guys in my next video. Bye.